I love the new resource API. Well, that's a really good use case for incremental hydration. So many new features from standalone to signals to SSR. What's up, everyone? This is Dariusz Kalbaczy, co-founder of MG Poland, JS Poland, and AI Poland. Welcome back to Angular Master Podcast. Today, we've got a very special guest. By the way, we are in Berlin on Google I.O. He is from New York City, USA, developer relations engineer at Google, passionate speaker, educator, and community builder. Ladies and gentlemen, Devin Chasanov. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here in Berlin, hanging out with so many Angular developers, and happy to be here with you. Thank you so much. First question for those who don't know you yet. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Absolutely. Yeah, so as you know from the introduction, my name is Devin Chasnoff. I'm a developer relations engineer on the Angular team. And honestly, I joke with people, the hardest part about my job, and especially for non-technical folks, my parents, uh, is really hard just explaining what my job is. But if I break it down, uh, I think the easiest way to say it is I get to spread all the awesomeness of Angular with the world. And I do that in a lot of different ways uh, along with the team. This is everything from uh, going to events, meeting with folks, but we're also really interested in making sure that we educate the community, whether that's through live streams, documentation, updates, and also just really connecting with the community to understand how everyone's using the product and how we can make it better. That sounds amazing. So you are a perfect guy in perfect place. Honestly, it's a, it's a dream come true working on the Angular team. I'm really happy to be here. Amazing. So what are the biggest new features in Angular 20 compared to the older versions like um, V16 or V17? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest, I think, theme that we've been focusing on is performance and developer experience. And that's something that we've been focusing on for a long time. I mean, if you look back prior to, you know, say V16, there, there was a big shift. And I, you know, it's funny, I, I saw some people saying that V20 was a boring release and they loved that. And I think a big part of that is we stabilized a lot of things. Like for example, uh, linked signal effect, some other signals in, you know, the reason that's important is now you can go out and start using those features with confidence, uh, knowing that, you know, it's, it's going to be there for you to keep using. And then we also released a lot of new features like uh, the new uh, resource signal, HTTP resource signal. And then on the performance side, there are a lot of uh, really cool updates on the SSR front, uh, updates on increment, uh, incremental hydration. Um, uh, server-side routing, uh, API config. So lots of new changes, but I think uh, DX and performance is, is re really where we've been focused and where you know, we'll continue to focus. So what does it mean that effects like uh, linked signals and two signals are now stable? And why is this important? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think a, a big part of the reason that you know, that is important is because when you start using a new feature in Angular, you know, you want to know that you can use it with confidence and not be worried that the API service is going to change right out from under you because especially with, you know, a feature like link signal, which in my opinion is, is one of the, I, I've described as like the missing link in a signal architecture where you can accomplish a lot of different things by, leveraging the previous value of, uh, of state. And if you start to build that into your application and you start relying on it for a lot of things, you, know, you don't want to have that worry that, hey, I'm going to have to refactor this code in the future because it's going to be gone. Whereas, you know, other experimental features, it's a great way to kind of test the water, see if it's for you, see how it works. But, you know, that API service might change or, you know, it could potentially even go away. But once it's stable, you can start using it knowing that you're, you're good. Amazing. 
Uh, Zoneless is now in developer preview. So can you explain that uh, what that is and why it's matter? Yeah, so this is a really exciting one. And I, I guess I'll give a little bit of context in case folks aren't familiar, but I think historically Angular has relied on Zone.js for change detection. And Zone.js, uh, it, it basically, it patches browser APIs in order to detect any changes in the UI, right? But the thing is, there are a lot more events that occur in the browser that than there are events that actually update your UI. So if you're triggering change detection for every browser update, that's a lot of unnecessary checks. So with Zoneless moving to developer preview, uh, what you can do is leverage Signal's inherent knowledge of uh, state changes in order to uh, manage that and remove Zone.js from your application altogether. And by doing so, you no longer have all those unnecessary checks and you get a lot more fine-grained control over when and how change detections run. How does the new resource API uh, help with async data like fetching users and uh, listening to web sockets? Yeah, so I, I, I love the new resource API and it's... I think the, the best way to think about it is it's a container for data that is fetched asynchronously. And what's great about it as a signal primitive, it's reactive. And that's both upstream and downstream. So the way a resource is structured is you'll define a params field, right? And that'll be usually just one signal, you can, you know, have a combination of signals and any time that params changes, like say, for example, you have a resource and it's dependent on a user ID. Anytime that user ID uh, changes, the, you'll define a function in a loader field and that function will run. And that way you don't have to actually manage that. That's automatically managed by your application and your signals. And what's also really cool is that as a, you know, part of the signal family, you might have other signals that are dependent on that resource and anything that's dependent on that resource will automatically update every time that loader function runs. Okay. So what's the difference between resource and HTTP resource? Uh, when should developers use each? Yeah. So the HTTP resource is effectively doing the same thing as just a regular resource. It's, I think there are two, two benefits to using it if you are making HTTP requests. So uh, the first one is just syntactic sugar. So in, in its simplest form, all it is, you just define your HTTP resource. So just taking a step back, an HTTP resource is just a resource specifically for fetching data via HTTP. Right, And in its simplest form, you can just have a string with an embedded uh, signal via you know, string interpolation. And instead of defining these different fields, anytime that changes, like say, for example, you had you know, an endpoint API slash user ID, same sort of thing. Anytime that changes, it'll automatically run, but it's you know, one line instead of you know, three. So it's a little cleaner. And it's also built on top of the HTTP client so you can leverage all of the features that HTTP client has right out of the box with the HTTP resource, just making it really convenient to work with. And then it has all those reactive features, which is great. Yeah, that sounds really good. Uh, how do Signals and RxJS work together now? And should we replace RxJS with Signals? That's a really good question. And I, I think, you know, I think long term, you know, some folks will always want to use RxJX and, uh, you know, it's baked into their architecture and it's hard to rip out. And while I've, you know, had the opportunity as, you know, in DevRel, I spin up new apps all the time. So for me, it's easy to just build an app completely dependent on signals. It's, you know, because I'm not maintaining it really like a production app. It's very simple. Um, but when I do that, I, I love the, you know, the signal kind of design pattern. It was one of those things where I was working with it for a little bit. And then 
when it really clicked how the data model works and you know how the data flows through the signals and there's no duplication you don't have to track things it was just it was so nice that i was like me personally i was like like this is the way this is awesome but if you want to use rxjs you can still use them together we have an rxjs interop package so that has things like there's a um a two signal method there's a two observable method so basically you can take an observable and convert it to a signal very easily um and vice versa so if you want to use them together you still can and or if you want to kind of migrate to an entirely signal based architecture you can do that too but you could do it over time and we just wanted to make sure that folks have the opportunity to work with signals but you know we didn't want to break anybody and we want to make sure everything's backwards compatible okay so uh, you mentioned the incremental hydration what is incremental hydration and why is it a big deal yeah so incremental so let's just taking a step back i think uh i just want just in case folks aren't familiar, we'll just cover SSR real quick, server-side rendering. And in a, in a server-side rendered app, your server will effectively create the entire HTML page, you know, fully populated with state and everything. It'll, it'll send that down uh, to the browser, right? So that's all, you know, it's, it looks good. It's ready to go. But in your browser, uh, you've got JavaScript running your Angular application, but that has no idea what's going on, you know, that, that is, hasn't synced up yet, right? So there's a process where uh, the browser uh, goes into the, basically goes into the HTML and it, it kind of syncs up. It, it uh, you know, tries not to reuse uh, existing nodes. It takes advantage of the state that's already baked into the application. And generally that process is called hydration but maybe you don't want to hydrate the entire application all at once. Maybe you want to do it in pieces, or maybe you want to do it when a specific UI piece is actually uh, touched or viewed or whatnot. Well, that's a really good use case for incremental hydration. And by doing so, you can actually send down smaller JavaScript bundles, and that way you have a smaller payload uh, while still preserving like a, a still a, a um, like a full application hydration experience, and you would generally do this. It's it's pretty simple to do. You just wrap it. So say you had a component that you wanted to incrementally hydrate. You can just wrap it in a defer block and use a placeholder if you want until it's uh, ready to go. You launched angular.dev slash AI. This is interesting question. Why? Is AI important for Angular developers? Uh, I'm glad you noticed that uh, because we think it's important too. Um, but I think it's important for Angular developers because AI is important for all developers, right? And as we kind of move forward and we're, we're learning the power of AI, what you can do, and as I think about it, there are kind of two different sides to this, right? So you have the one side, which I think a lot of, folks are talking about, which is generating code w using LLMs. And then the other side is actually infusing your app with AI functionality, which means that you can do things that you had never done before, create user experience that never existed. So we created angular.dev slash AI in order to help developers understand both of these use cases. So on the former front, generating code, you know, there are a lot of things that you, you need to know. And I, in the last couple of years, like we've had an explosion of productivity, right? There's so many new features from standalone to signals to SSR. And I think one of the kind of challenges that we've seen is that LLMs, you know, they, they're trained on a specific uh, set of data, but that you know, you have to define a point in time where it stops looking at the data, right? So if we're making all of these changes and it's looking historically, maybe it picks up the wrong syntax or something like that. You know, for example, one of the things I've seen is you like sometimes an LM will, will refer to the old control flow syntax instead of the new 
uh, control flow syntax. But you think about the developer experience or user experience? So this is this is just on the developer experience generating code, right? So say you're in you know Firebase Studio yeah. uh, and working with it. So uh, even though those challenges exist today, there are ways to work around it until the LLMs catch up. And for example, you know one of the things that we might do is use in Firebase Studio, for example, there's a, an AI rules.md file that kind of dictates how the app will, how the, the code will be rendered. Like you can tell the LLM, always use the new control flow syntax, always use standalone components, things like that. And this way we can kind of provide folks with this new portal, we can provide folks with guidance on how to do that. And one of the, the cool things is it's not just limited to getting the syntax right. Like say you're, you know, your organization has a certain way of doing things, you have a style, well, you can bake that in and I'll share the same AI rules file and that way you can all generate consistent code. Um, so that's just one example, but there, you know, there are other resources on that page that teach you how to generate code effectively that uses the modern syntax, if that's what you want, uh, and things like that. And then on the other side, there's some really cool tools out there that make developing with AI a lot easier. One I've played around with a ton is GenKit which is a, a library that just makes it really easy to use Gemini, for example. And, uh, you know, I, I was having fun with this. I built a, an interactive choose your own adventure graphic novel app. Uh, and I did that with, with GenKit. So the other thing that this new portal does is it, it introduces you to these tools, provides code samples, um, links to other resources. So we really just want to make sure that Angular developers have what they need to develop now and in the future. And we'll keep adding to that portal as, you know, we learn more because, you know, it's an ever-evolving evol uh, environment and, you know, we want to make sure everyone's well-equipped. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I really like it. Uh, what is LLM Takesta? So how does it help AI tools write better Angular code? Yeah, so this is basically just a, a file that, you know, we're, we're using that LLMs can know that, hey, like, look at this file. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, in Google search, you put some certain files on your page, so it crawls and it knows, you know, keywords and things. So this is a, a hint to the LLMs that way when they actually train, they know, okay, these are the important links that we should look at. That way we know what the, you know, the best styles and syntax and everything is to, to look at. Which Angular feature you love? Oh. There are a lot. I uh, standalone was just one of those things where I was, you know, I, I I just become used to using ng modules until I didn't have to, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Uh, so that was just like from a, a like a an everyday coding perspective. That was a great one. But personally, I I love working with signals. Um, it's almost like when I. I often say like signals take the management out of state management. I said that a few times and, you know, whatever talks and live streams. And uh, I almost like to play a game when I'm writing, you know, when I'm managing state is like, how, how can I write this application where I am as the developer have to set the state as few times as humanly possible? Like, how can I make it that only UI interactions and, and, you know, data coming back from the server is the only thing that updates my application. It's almost like a, a puzzle uh, where I could try to figure out the most efficient way to manage my state. And from my perspective, like just doing all that feels a lot more natural. So I've been having a ton of fun just coding with signals. My last question. Uh, what is the story behind the new Angular mascot? Ooh, yes. And we will really get a plushie. Yeah, so we've got an RFC out right now for a brand new Angular mascot. And I don't know, there's much of a story behind it other than, you know, uh, some of our, you know, the Flutter team has a, a mascot, the Firebase team has a mascot. And I think we just all wanted a little toy, a little plushie uh, to go along with Angular. Uh, but the RFC is still open for a few days. I don't know when this is going to air, but if it's still open, you can vote, voice your opinion, and uh, maybe get a new plushie one day. Perfect. Uh, Devin, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing discussion. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you here. 
for all our listeners. Please subscribe the channel, smash the button, ring the bell, and see you in the next podcast.